Well, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this weekend's online worship service from uh, Church of the Highlands here in San Bruno, California. So glad that you're uh, joining us on this uh, Christmas uh, weekend. Hope you, uh, even though it's been a very different year, hope you had a great Christmas. Uh, just want to remind you of a couple of things before we officially begin the service. And uh, a little bit later in this uh, service, you're going to be uh, given the opportunity to celebrate the communion. So if you need to go and get some elements that are going to function as your communion elements, that would be a, a great opportunity to do that right now. And then, um, just a reminder that the songs we're going to be singing this morning, the texts and the lyrics for those songs are on our website. Just go to the homepage at highlands.us and there will be a button right on that homepage that says uh, Weekend Song Lyrics. So a great way for you to be able to join us as uh, we worship. Well, I know that Christmas is officially over, but we always like to prolong it a little bit more here at Highlands. So this morning's uh, worship selections are um, new versions of uh, Familiar Carol. So I hope that you'll lift your voices and join in. Let's join Josh and the team right now as they lead us in this weekend's worship.
Well, again, uh, so glad that you're with us this uh, weekend here at uh, Church of the Highlands. Uh, just a reminder that it's uh, always a great opportunity to connect in with us on our website at highlands.us. If you haven't been there recently, it has been, uh, the homepage has been completely redone. And so uh, check out what's uh, happening there. There's uh, a lot of information on groups that you can be part of, uh, weekly devotionals um, that you can listen to, resources during this uh, COVID time. Uh, and uh, some new events that are going to be uh, popping up here pretty shortly. So make sure that you're checking in each week at highlands.us. And then for those of you that have been so faithful uh, in uh, giving online, we just say thank you. You have allowed us the opportunity to uh, continue to reach out to not only our own Bay Area community, but literally around the world uh, with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for your continued giving. If you haven't already considered establishing regular online giving for Highlands, uh, just check it out. It's easy, and uh, then you don't even have to think about it. And then uh, if you missed uh, Christmas Eve here at Highlands, which is really one of the loveliest nights of the year, you still have an opportunity to um, view that service. Just go to our website. It will be there for a little while. And uh, you can be part of a really the loveliest night of the year here at uh, Church of the Highlands. Well, this week, Pastor Layton brings us the message. Let's join him now. Hi, I'm Pastor Layton of Church of the Highlands in San Bruno, California. And this is Sunday, December 27 of 2020. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, we're so very thankful for your word and the reason for the season. And Lord, as we open your word and give attention to it now, we ask you to be our teacher and transform the way we think and speak and act as your word and your spirit is at work within us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1. We're in the Gospel of John, and we're in chapter 1. You know, mankind was designed for relationship, and that relationship is made possible uh, through Jesus Christ, a relationship with God Almighty. And there are many facets to our relationship with our, uh, our Heavenly Father. And uh, as we look at the passage today, we're going to be reminded of one of the greatest blessings that we have as uh, those who are part of Christ Jesus. John's gospel begins with these words. He's, he writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So he begins with the word, in the beginning was the word, and he intentionally connects the first words of his gospel with the first words of the Old Testament. In the beginning, God created. And what he's saying here is when the creation began, the word was already there. The word has always been. The word is not one of the created things. Christ did not come into existence at creation or at conception. Here, John is describing the pre-existence of Christ. And then he says, and the word was with God. And this statement makes it abundantly clear that he is separate and distinct from God the Father. And one of the uh, striking things that we find in the Old Testament is that God speaks to himself in the plural, uh, such as in Genesis chapter 1, where it reads, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let us, that's plural. Uh, make man an hour, that's plural. He, God speaks to himself in uh, the plural. And, and so it reveals to us that there's always been a close relationship between the word and God. If you, if you take the preposition literally, it means that the word was toward God. Uh, they have existed in, for all eternity in the closest possible relationship. In fact, some have suggested face-to-face -face is a way to uh, think about this. They have existed throughout eternity past face-to-face -face in relationship. And then the next description that we're given is that the word was God. And this here is given to us to answer any erroneous suggestion that if the word was with God, then the word could not possibly be God. This statement sets us straight. This is perhaps one of the most clear and direct uh, declarations of the deity of Christ Jesus. The Word was God. 
Now, every language has rules that clarify meaning. So, for instance, in English, uh, sentences are usually constructed subject, predicate, and an adjective is put immediately before the noun that it modifies, such as the blue truck. And there are such rules that exist in the Greek language as well. And in spite of the clear meaning of these words, there have been some who've distorted the interpretation to support doctrines that are contrary to Scripture about the nature of Christ Jesus. Here the word theos, which is translated God, is not preceded by a definitive article or definite article. And there are some like the Jehovah's Witnesses who have mistranslated the phrase to mean the word was a God. And it's an unbiblical position. The reason that the article, the definite article, was not given was because it would lead to a meaning and translation somewhat akin to the word was the God, which would contradict the very previous statement. So, um, he says the word was God, and here he's leaving open the possibility that there might be more to God than the word. But it also is very clear that nothing short of God will do for our understanding of the word. The word was God. So one of the truths of the Christian faith that is non-negotiable is, is the deity of Christ, that Christ is God in the flesh. And what we're told in the New Testament in Second, uh, Second John is that if somebody comes to our house telling us something that is contrary to the scripture that we're not even supposed to receive them into our house. Now, any confusion about the deity of Christ is really inexcusable because the Bible is very, very clear. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then to further solidify a correct and biblical understanding of who Christ is, look at verse 14. It says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now verse 14 is so rich. Let's break it down phrase by phrase. It says, and the word became flesh. And so it contains one of the most concise statements on the incarnation that God took on humanity. And here's a shattering idea that God would come and live as a human person. And the, and the union of these two natures in the person of Christ is one of the mysteries of our faith. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, without question, this is the great mystery of our faith. Christ was revealed in a human body. He was the God-man. Now, the union of the two natures was necessary in order for him to perfectly fit his role as mediator between God and men for several reasons. First was that it made possible Christ's death. Hebrews 2.14 says, Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became, became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break, break the power of the devil who had the power of death. It says only as a human being could he die and break the power of the devil. Now, there's also a second reason why it's important for God to become man. And that is so that he can fully experience our weaknesses. Uh, the author of Hebrews wrote, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. He experienced all that we experienced. He was tired. He was hungry. He had disappointments. He had misunderstandings uh, with people. And because he's fully experienced life as we have yet without sin, he's able to help us when we're going through difficult times. And then there's a third reason why God became a man, and that was to provide us an example of how to live a life that is pleasing to God. In fact, Christ is our example. The Apostle Peter said, To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Now, the incarnation does not mean that God dwelt in a man, but that God became a man. 
he, he became what he was not previous, though he never ceased to be what he was before. The babe that was born in Bethlehem was Emmanuel, God with us. Now, some of us might believe or think that uh, God becoming a human is, is not possible. It's inconceivable. How could such a thing be? And when we allow ourselves to think along those lines, we need to be reminded of what the angel said when he made the announcement. He asked, is anything too hard for God? Is anything too difficult for God? And of course, the answer is, there is nothing too difficult for God. This is how God works. It says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And dwelt is an interesting word, skinuo. It literally means to live in a tent. We're reminded of God with his people in the Old Testament. Uh, the tent was a tabernacle. And you remember that God designed the way the camp was to be laid out. And he wanted himself and his tabernacle to be right in the middle of the people. So the tribes were spread out north and, and west and south and east. But God was right in the middle. That tells us something about God. He wants to be right in the middle of his people, not just somewhere along the edges. And then when we look forward, as it's revealed in Revelation, we're told that God will again tent with his people. Revelation 21 tells us, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is among men and he will dwell. That's that word, skinuo. He will dwell among them and they shall be his people and God himself will be among them and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. And, and the word that's translated seen here is used of things that are seen with a physical eye, not just visions. And we're reminded that on the Mount of Transfiguration, it was Peter, James, and John that saw Jesus revealed to them. In fact, he's described as his face shone like the sun and his garments became white as light. But it's probably the author's intention to show uh, Christ's revelation uh, wider in scope, that it was in Jesus that we found uh, God revealed his truth and wisdom and love and knowledge and power and goodness and holiness. You know, it's very difficult to find a, a word that translates the original word that we find glory. In fact, the literal translation is brightness or shining. And, and that's why some artists have depicted Jesus with a halo. Uh, and that's not actually something that we find in the scripture. So really when it talks about revealing the glory of God, it's revealing about how wonderful he is, how great he is. Glory is of the only son from the father. And, and, and the word here only means one of a kind, that he is unique, that he has no equal. He alone is able to reveal the Father. He is the unique Son of God. Now, we are children of God, but we are children of God through adoption. God has chosen to adopt us, but, he, but Jesus is unique. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Grace and truth are are fascinating words. The, the words themselves uh, are interesting. The word grace uh, describes something that's not earned or deserved. And our uh, relationship with God is not anything that we can earn or deserve. It is an expression of love on God's part that we even can have a relationship with him. And, and the second word is truth. And Jesus said, I am the truth. And if we want to see the truth, we need to look at Jesus. If we want to know the truth, we need to look at Jesus. If we want to know the truth about God, we need to look at Jesus because he reveals the truth about God. But there's also something else about this description as well. And, and that is that grace and truth are two essential elements to a healthy, a healthy and happy relationship. A healthy and happy relationship. And it was for relationship that Jesus came, that we could have relationship with God. And in order to have a healthy, happy relationship, that relationship must be filled with grace and truth. And if you have one without the other, it's not a healthy, happy relationship. If, if, if you're around a person who is gracious but not truthful, then they, they might be a pleasant person to be with for a while, but you never really understand where they're at because they, they don't speak the truth. And, and it's not a worthwhile investment to make in, in a relationship with someone who you're not quite sure is solid in, the, in telling the truth. And yet, on the other hand, someone who is truthful but lacks grace is eventually going to be abrasive, and you're not going to want to have a relationship with such a person. 
So a healthy relationship is one that is filled with both grace and truth. It's a relationship in which we can be completely transparent. We can be ourselves. We can hide nothing. We can speak the truth and uh, know that the other party is going to love us and accept us, and they're going to correct us graciously. And so a healthy relationship is built on both grace and truth. And again, we're designed for relationship with God and with each other. And Jesus, uh, the, even the law, it provides a structure for good relationships. And, and Jesus makes this clear when he's answering the question about what is the greatest commandment. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. The commandment is to love. Love is relational uh, by nature. And so even the law was given to provide a structure for healthy relationships. Now, we've been talked about the uniqueness of Christ. Uh, why did he come into the world? Well, look at verse 9. It says, The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man but of God. And so John is concerned that we should miss neither the good news of the incarnation nor the tragedy of human rejection of Christ. He wrote, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Coming into the world is a unique description of Christ uh, because he pre-existed and so he came into the world. And he was the true light, the genuine light. John the Baptist is described in the Bible as being a lamp that reveals the light, but it's Jesus who is the light. He is the real light, the genuine light. And the Bible here says that the, the, the light gives light to everyone. The Bible says that everyone has been exposed to some degree of, of light and is therefore without excuse. We find these words in Romans chapter 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. What the Bible tells us time and time again is everyone has been given some degree of light. Now, there are two responses that people have to Christ. Some reject and others receive. And, and so the author begins by describing those who reject Christ. He says, he was in the world and the world was made through him. And yet the world did not know him. Know here is used in the sense of approving or loving. And so he begins by talking about the world in general. And to the world, Jesus looked like uh, just a mere man. I mean, uh, he, he walked and he talked and he grew tired and he, he slept and he was hungry and he did all the things that regular men do and they had no knowledge of the scriptures that revealed what God was going to do, so they did not know him. And that was not true of God's people because it says he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. They were his people because he had chosen them in times past and he'd given them the oracles that described what he was going to do and when he was going to do it and how he was going to do it and, and what to look for. And it wasn't that they didn't know him, it was that they didn't receive him. They chose to reject him because he didn't come as they expected him to come. The Bible talks about people not accepting Christ because they are blinded. And sometimes they are blinded by the prince of the power of, of the air. Uh, he, Satan and his demons want the knowledge of God suppressed. They don't want people to hear about or know about God and his love and his salvation. They, he wants people to live in, in the dark. And so Satan would love nothing better than to silence Christ-centered Bible teaching churches around the world. He wants the knowledge of God suppressed. And there's another reason why people sometimes reject Christ, and that's because they hate the light. Jesus said, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light 
and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. So another reason why some people reject the true light, Jesus, is because they, they love the darkness. They love their wickedness. They, they love their sin. They don't want it to be exposed. They don't want to be told that what they are doing is wrong. And there are some who call themselves Christians today who do not believe they are being Christ-like when they call sin, sin. And if they knew Christ, they would realize that Christ called sin, sin. He dealt graciously with a sinner, but he called sin what it was. For instance, when the woman was caught in adultery and was brought to Jesus, he said, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. He called it for what it was. What she was engaged in was sin. Jesus was always gracious towards the sinner, but he never condoned sin. Some people reject Christ because they love darkness rather than light. There are many reasons why people reject Christ. Then our author, John, he goes on to contrast people who receive Jesus from those who do not. He says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You know, God is never surprised when certain people decide to re reject Jesus. And, and some people think of the relationship between God's sovereignty and man's will as being an either-or option. Either God is sovereign or man has a free will. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that man, mankind does have their own will. They, and, and they're held accountable for the decisions that they make. And the Bible also teaches that God is sovereign and that his plans will always come to pass, even if he's dealing with people who have plans of their own. God is sovereign. He said, but to all who did receive him, he believed in his name. Now the concept of name in the ancient Middle East spoke more than just the label attached to the, to the person. Uh, it, when we, in fact, it, we mean something similar today when we say that we're speaking in someone's name, we're speaking on their behalf, that we're, it means that we're speaking with their authority and expressing and holding their positions and their views. So more than just believing that Jesus existed, it is believing that he is who he claimed to believe, that all who receive him, who believed in his name, who have received Jesus for who he claimed to be, Ha, he has given the right to become children of God. Now this is, this is profound, and so I want to come back to it. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And what these three negative statements uh, stress is that salvation is not obtainable by human efforts. No one can become a child of God because of their national or family bloodline that no one can become a child of God by the will of the flesh, that is the will of the individual. And, and the reason for that is the Bible says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Something that's dead can't do anything. Something that's dead doesn't even know that it's dead. It can't, it can't save itself, it can't move itself. And the will of man describes any system that is designed that people put their faith in that think that, that somehow or other the will of man is gonna make something happen. Uh, it describes religions that are designed to supposedly put God under an obligation uh, to save. The only way we can be saved is of God, that God provides salvation. So Ephesians chapter 2 says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. We can't even take credit for the fact that we believe. Even our ability to believe is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so none of us can boast about it. We can't obligate God. We can't work for it. We can't earn it. We can't deserve it. We are simply saved by grace through faith. And then coming back to what we said here, uh, but to all who did receive him, who believed in, name, in his name, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The right to become children of God. This is profound. Now, these first 18 verses of John's gospel are the introduction or the prologue. And, and what he does is he highlights some of the major points that he's going to be unveiling in the, in the chapters to come. And he could have chosen 
perhaps one of the other benefits that comes to us from being in Christ. He could have, he could have talked about the purpose for living that we're given in Christ, that we're, we're given a purpose to make disciples. He could have talked about the hope that we have when life has run its course, that he's preparing a place that we're going to spend with him for all eternity. He could have talked about the benefits that come from being part of a family, brothers and sisters in Christ, as we help each other through the difficulties of this life. But he focused on the fact that we are given the right to become children of God. Not children of wrath, but children of God. We were destitute, but now we are joint heirs with Christ, that we have everything in common with him, that he's loved us so much that he's adopted us into his very own family. And, and, and you know, every adoption is a choice. And God chose us. He chose you and he chose me. Matthew Henry wrote, the son of God became a son of man, that the sons and daughters of men might become the sons and daughters of God. And so when somebody asks you what the big deal about Christmas is, and the benefits of being a Christian. Maybe one of the first things we should consider expressing is the fact that in Christ, we have been given the right to become children of God. Lord, we're so thankful that in Christ, we receive so many benefits. Salvation from our sin, purpose in living, hope when life has run its course. But of all, the greatest is that we can address the creator of the universe as our Father who art in heaven. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Our communion today is going to be uh, complementary to our message about the uniqueness of Christ and is taken from Colossians chapter 1. And if you don't have your elements prepared, why don't you just take a moment, hit the pause and, and go get the elements and then rejoin us when, you, when you're ready to partake of communion. We've been talking today about the uniqueness of Christ and the Apostle Paul wrote this in Colossians chapter 1. He wrote, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all of his fullness was pleased to dwell in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who are once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions, and yet now, he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and, with, and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. And now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. And as a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. You know, that's only possible through Christ because I think each and every one of us are aware that each and every day we think or say or do something that's displeasing to the Lord. And aren't you thankful that we're welcome to come before the throne of grace in our time of need and ask forgiveness and cleansing? And the elements that we hold remind us of the great price that was paid. Because the peace that we have with God was made possible by Christ's blood shed on the cross. Lord, we are so thankful that you've loved us so incredibly much that you've provided for our salvation and our adoption. The elements that we hold remind us that there was a great price paid and we partake in remembrance. Let's partake of the bread.
and also the cup. Thank you, Lord, for coming, living, giving us an example, dying to pay for our sin, rising again to prove who you are and that your claims are true. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We hold this darling night, a king is born in Bethlehem. Our journey long, we seek the light, the peace to the hollow and manger ground. What fear we felt in the silence. pray. Lord, we are so thankful for our time together today. We're so thankful for all that you have done for us. We're so thankful for the reason for the season. And Lord, we're thankful that we look forward to Christ's return. We're at the close of one year, the beginning of a new year. We don't know what the new year brings, but we know that you do. And we know that you do all things well. And we know that with each passing year, we are closer and closer to your return. Thank you for the hope that is ours in Christ, our Savior and Lord. May you be glorified always, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>